What's going on guys? It's so Flo Antonio. Today we're in the streets of New York City with our little brother Omar. And it's mommy makeout day. And if you live in today's society, you probably use social media. And I wanted to see how easy it would be to get personal information from complete strangers. Well today we're gonna put that to the test. Let's find out. Check it out. So Flo Antonio. Joey Salads, Lance Stewart, Prank Invasion, Roman Atwood, Jack Jones. Hey, can I have a handbag, please? It was just a joke! No, you can't. Octv, Vitaly TV, Big Dos TV, Dennis TV. I'm starting to see somewhat of a trend in names here. TV. Kobe Person, Angry Picnic, That Was Epic, Andrew Hales, Cassidy Campbell, Magic of Rahat. And we're only just getting started. At one point in time, the YouTube prank genre reigned supreme over all other video styles. A legacy so deep that when we think of quintessential 2014 to 2016 YouTube, pranksters often stand out as the most memorable individuals, both for good and bad reasons. But I use the word legacy because, as we all know, pranking on YouTube slowly faded out of the spotlight. Another genre laid to rest in the graveyard of YouTube's history. History. What made pranking so attractive in the beginning? Was there a specific type of person that was attracted to the idea of being a prankster? How did fake pranks contribute to the fall of the genre? These are the questions that I hope to answer when I began my research. But this was a big topic to handle. I needed to call upon the help of a former YouTube prankster who could give me real insight into how things went down back in the pranking days. Someone with first-hand experience. Someone who witnessed pranking spectacular fall with their own eyes. I needed to call in the big guns. What's up guys, I'm Joey Salads, and today we're going to be doing a social experiment. I'll say around 2016, I think that's when the bubble started to burst um, and had a lot of factors had to deal with it. A prank is a mischievous trick played on someone, generally causing the victim to experience embarrassment, perplexity, confusion, or discomfort. And while pranks are as old as the concept of jokes themselves, pranks and practical jokes done on video for commercial purposes wouldn't become a popular concept until around 2005, with shows such as Balls of Steel, and individuals like Remy Gaylard. And while these shows were being popularized on public television, YouTube was slowly brewing in the background, ready to give individual creators the ability to share their own pranks at some point in the future. This would begin in around 2007 with individuals like Jack Vale Films, who from what I can tell had one of, if not the very first YouTube prank series titled The Pooter Fighting in Public Prank Series. This would then evolve slightly by 2009 into classics like The Greatest Freakout Ever. Okay, my mom just canceled my brother's uh, World of Warcraft account and he is freaking out. And Prank vs. Pranks first view videos like Girlfriend Fake Head in Bed Scare Prank. <laughs> These videos all followed a similar kind of premise. A hidden camera, a somewhat creative practical joke, and a reaction that would give everyone a laugh. And in the beginning, one thing was obvious. The bar was set so incredibly low for what needed to be done in order to get views. A fart in public, putting a fake head next to a loved one, a freak out over a video game. In many instances, there wasn't even a need for any kind of public embarrassment besides from the audience who would eventually watch the video on YouTube. And YouTube pranks would continue with this fairly basic structure for a period of approximately two years until around 2011, when pranks transitioned from playing jokes on friends and family to playing jokes on the public. I just want to kiss you. three feet away from me right now, all right? Yeah, I just want to kiss huh? you. Yeah? I just want to... Huh? In early 2011, individuals such as Vitaly would begin his Disturbing the Peace series, doing exactly what the title suggests, Disturbing the Peace. We're just trying to have some fun, looks like you're bored. Yeah, have some fun with someone else. Once again, we can tell that the bar is set pretty low for laughs. Trying to kiss random people, hopping on the back of a bike owned by someone you don't know, hugging strangers. The content was somewhat entertaining, but far from creative. However, this was already in the process of changing once again. By early 2012, as pranking became slightly more popular on the YouTube platform, <laughs> in order to stand out, pranksters began to add a bit more creativity into their practical jokes. Seen with Vitaly's DUI ticket inspector prank of February 2012. I want you to stop and do a 360 and then walk again. 360. Oh, uh, sir. Sir. You told me to do a 360. I got All right, well, do a good 360 without any. And Remy Gaylord's Raider prank of January 2012. 
And what do you think this increased creativity did for the genre? Well, it led to an increase in general video quality and the viewership of the genre as a whole began to climb, taking the genre into the semi-mainstream. Other creators then slowly started to catch on to this climbing viewership and wanted to introduce their own video ideas, as seen with other creators in 2012 such as Magic Over Hat where he would take his ideas to the local drive-thru. <laughs> Oh. Oh. And it wasn't only other YouTubers that were catching on to the rising viewership, as pranking would shortly begin on another newly rising platform where it would see similar levels of success. Can you tell me how big my butt look in these shorts? Oh. Hey, I'm sorry, hey, prank, prank, prank! At the time, this new platform was almost unknown, represented by nothing but a green letter V, however, would later become the incredibly popular media site known as Vine. Uh, I started out on Vine, and one yeah. of my biggest things on Vine was it's bash in time, and I'll destroy my family's belongings with an axe. It's time! You mom! I kill you! Jump in! Vine was favorable for beginners in the pranking world because the videos only had to be seven seconds, there wasn't a whole lot of skill required, and there was a reasonable demand for pranks on the platform. Use barrier. Use barrier. This gave birth to pranksters such as Jack Jones. Are you serious? Smoke is bad for your health. Oh! It was just a joke. Lance Stewart. <laughs> and of course, our man Joey Salads. What's up, guys? Who eventually realized that moving their pranks to YouTube wasn't such a difficult transition considering they already had basic video making skills. So I started yeah. to move my entire audience over to YouTube and I'm like, what's a genre that I can transition over well for? And I would make yeah. longer versions of the bash in time and then I'm like, okay, that's pranks. That's a prank. Yeah. So I stuck with that prank genre. And upon switching from Vine to YouTube, these pranksters would by default become the competition of individuals like Vitaly, who was really starting to steer the pranking ship into the YouTube mainstream. Vitaly's ideas had become even more creative and provocative, giving him a reputation as a tough guy who was really willing to mess with people in order to create content for his fans. You're making a scene in here. What are you doing? Na, na, na. Get! My mama told me. Get out of here! This would start to show with his classics such as Do You Even Lift Prank in January 2013. Do you even lift, bro? Yeah. All right, you look on that skin delicious, man. You know, the girl's bigger than you. Better start lifting. And put your number in my phone in February 2013. Put your phone number in my phone, please. Mm -hmm. Sure. However, it would be in October 2013 when Vitaly would post a video that would take YouTube pranks into the mainstream. The extraordinarily infamous Gold Digger prank. Oh, now you want to. Too bad. I don't like gold diggers. This prank is often recalled as one of the most famous viral YouTube pranks ever posted, with many of the comments referencing its significance in the early days of prank culture. Within a week, Vitaly's gold digger prank had hit 25 million views, revealing one main thing to both the viewers and other creators. There was a massive desire for pranking content on YouTube, and anyone with a camera as well as a little bit of confidence could go ahead and get themselves involved. For this reason, pranksters began to pop up left right and center, taking the genre into the mainstream. Joey Salads, Dennis TV, Moen ET, aka Oc TV, all of which popping up shortly after the realization that pranks might be the golden ticket to the chocolate factory. What's going on guys, this is Mo. This is ET. This is Oc TV. Today we're in the hood. We're gonna go up to people and ask them if we could kick them. But what did more pranksters on the platform mean? That's a question worth asking and if anything almost needs to be answered before we proceed. It meant that it was harder to stand out. In the beginning, as previously mentioned, even the most basic of pranks could get views. But as the competition increased, the quality, creativity, and most significantly, the ridiculousness of the pranks needed to increase in order to stand out. But back then, it was kind of a bubble that was forming where everybody needed to one-up each other and just make a bigger and better and crazier and is, you know, zombie attack on the street or ripping someone's, you know, guts out, a gun getting pulled out, getting the cops, getting arrested. Now, there's no problem with this. It seems to be the natural progression of almost every genre since YouTube began. A video style gets a lot of views in the beginning with extremely basic videos. People catch on and go, oh, well, if that extremely basic video got a lot of views, then if I had a little bit of creativity and effort into it, maybe I'll get more views. And the ultimate result is a handful of creators competing for the most entertaining videos in a certain category. However, pranks are a slightly different beast in this comparison, because unlike almost any other genre, you can cut corners a little bit. How? A little thing by the name of fake pranks. Because everything was escalating in the prank genre, everybody needed to one-up the other person. We all yeah. know how that went out. Everyone yeah. had to start. Yeah. Because they all follow one very simple slogan. 
Fake it till you make it. In the beginning of YouTube pranking, it was just taken as fact by every prankster's audience that the pranks were 100% real. 2013, 2014, like no one had that filter. It was like, it, whatever you watch, you just assume that it was real. And now it's just the complete opposite. It's like, whatever you watch, yep. you assume it's fake. Most prank videos had an authentic feel to them with many creators even going to the effort of uploading the outtakes, which gave everyone's audience almost certainty that what they were witnessing was completely authentic. Could you put your phone number in my phone? <laughs> Sorry. You're married. Oh. <laughs> but as previously mentioned, as the competition increased, the authenticity began to fall out of the pranking genre. It began to seem like things didn't really add up in the prank videos that were being posted. Things started to seem too good to be true. Vitaly going and hooking up with hot girls on the beach. Uh, do you think I'm attractive? Uh, <laughs> I guess so. I mean, you're all right. I'm all right. Wow. Fuzzy Tubes escaped prisoner prank. <laughs> In retrospect, there's nothing real about what was occurring in these videos. But we have to remember this was still early 2014. Nobody had that filter we have now where we think about whether a video is real or fake. There's that understanding now where when you see a prank video anywhere for anything, you just assume it's fake. Almost everyone was still oblivious and didn't question the authenticity, but as things got more and more ridiculous, other creators began to start questioning the legitimacy of these prank videos, and it wouldn't be long before everyone caught on to how simple faking these pranks was. The ultimate result, every fake prankster began to get exposed. When I was talking about the fake pranks, when people started doing mm -hmm. fake to one-up each other, people mm -hmm. got exposed more and more. Everybody got exposed. Which began the culture around exposing and clowning on fake pranks. There's a whole Whole genre of content exposing the pranks. And if there was one person to make everyone question the motive of each and every YouTube prankster, it was Ethan and Ela from H3H3 Productions. Yeah, and I was like angry. I was like, this video is so stupid. Ethan and Ela seemed to be able to see something that no one else could, or perhaps everyone could see it and simply didn't have the platform to call it out. Regardless, as these pranks went from subtly fake to obviously fake, they were on the front foot when it came to calling them out. H3H3 Productions would upload their first prank parody in December 2014, around one year after pranking would hit the mainstream, which was around the same point that fake pranks were getting so ridiculous that making ironic prank videos was completely feasible. What's your problem? Dude, it's just a prank, man. Oh, I am the ultimate prankster. In this first video, Ethan reviewed one of the most infamous fake pranksters, Prank Invasion, who was on the forefront of pushing the boundaries with what you could make possible through fake pranks. Now, Chris from Prank Invasion is definitely one of my favorite goofsters and gaffsters and one of the ultimate pranksters of all time. As previously mentioned, H3H3 reviews started to popularize the culture as well as make it enjoyable to clown on the pranking genre. Yeah. Then you had H3H3, you know, making parodies of it. And that, that's what made it have the perception that it was, you know, part of the YouTube culture. H3 then began to review other pranksters such as OCTV. My parents have a big penthouse in Manhattan, but sometimes we come to the slums to make fun of the poor black people. <laughs> and Kobe Person. I've been talking to these girls for the last three or four days. This guy's just been chatting up little girls for like three or four days straight. Ultimately increasing the popularity of the prank genre significantly. He definitely made it more popular because he yeah. made it fun and entertaining to rip on it and yeah. to pay attention to it. And while in the beginning H3H3 was a massive aid in popularizing the genre, as time progressed, the power he had would ultimately become a negative over the long run. Do you think you hit a point where you were just making videos with the idea that people would be reviewing them? Let's just make the craziest thing that we can possibly make in order for as many people to review it as possible to get as much exposure as possible. Was that the yep. motive by the end of it? Yeah, no, that, that was it. As time progressed, many of the fake pranksters started to catch on to the fact that they could get mass exposure through H3H3, and the stupidity of the pranks began to get out of control. When you get covered on H3H3, you'll get an extra million views, you make an extra 2,000, 3,000 bucks. Yeah. CPM's really low on pranks. You yeah. get covered on this person, you get more views, you get more subs. Many creators like Joey Salad stated that it became less about making actual entertaining pranks for your fans, and more about just making your pranks crazy enough for H3H3 to review them. Them because every time H3H3 would feature each prankster, they'd get millions of views. And obviously, the crazier the prank, the more likely it was that one of these creators such as H3H3 would do a review on it, speeding up the previously discussed process where creators were trying to make the craziest content possible. And unfortunately, this craziness could only go to such a height where it would eventually hit a ceiling. Do you think that there was a point where pranking was just like, 
it, it, it had hit a ceiling. Like it couldn't get any I'll more crazy. That's what that point happened with me. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you in just okay, a minute. Okay, right, yeah, all right. There was one video that eventually burst the bubble when it came to prank review channels. And the bubble really burst with when I faked probably one of the worst videos yet. Was that the one where you bashed up the car? The Trump car one. Ah. Yeah. I got a car, put some Trump apparel on it, and we're gonna park it in a black neighborhood and see what happens. He walks away from the car, and it's it's almost, I swear to God, it's like a comedy scene. That uh, that Trump car video, that was my big, you know, you know, real, realization moment, and that's also what kind of killed pranking uh, genre like that. Think about H3H3 began to catch on. He realized that the only reason these pranksters were making these insane videos was so that he could review them for exposure. Waiting for H3H3 reaction video on this, Prank Invasion says, Me too. You can't purposely make a video for H3H3 Productions to react to. It needs to be natural cringe. And that's true. When you become self-aware and baiting, that invalidates the cringe and automatically makes it something not interesting to watch. The ultimate result? The integrity of prank reviews began to diminish and the prank reviews began to fall out of the spotlight. However, the slowdown in fake prank reviews was really only the beginning of the end. There was another YouTube dark phenomena looming on the horizon. When the demonetization started to happen, it was like, you know, 50,000 views and you know, nothing really change with the content but then it'll be like okay this one got 50,000 views this one got 3 million this one got 20,000 views this one got 2 million and it was more all over the place because I I saw the algorithm picking and choosing which one was suitable and which one was not. YouTube's infamous adpocalypse. The event that would be the end of YouTube for many controversial creators and pranksters weren't exempt from this in the least. In August 2016, YouTube would shift their focus towards family-friendly content while removing ad revenue on videos deemed to be too controversial for advertisers. Advertisers fearing backlash removed their ads entirely from YouTube and during this period, every YouTuber saw a decrease in revenue. This significantly reduced the income for many prank channels which had never been a problem in the years prior. Social media used to be the wild, wild west. And this was also at the time where everything was getting monetized. You know, you can get beat up, beat to a bloody pulp, and you'll still have monetization on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Following the adpocalypse, creators such as Dennis ATV would quit making pranks for a two year period, ultimately leading to the death of his channel. While creators like Mo and Ethan, aka OcTV, have only uploaded four pranks since the event over four years ago. And it makes sense, really. As explained by Joey, these prank videos had hit the point of being more of a business than a fun little home project. Yeah, social media is a business. Yeah. It's not what it used to be, you just make something fun for fun. And what about the pranksters who continued despite the demonetization? Well, YouTube began to suppress their videos as a result of their inability to bring in revenue. YouTube says that monetization doesn't change how much a video is promoted, but almost every creator I've talked to has had an instance of their views dropping following a video being demonetized, which is also what I've found personally. Demonetization suppresses it. It's being constantly suppressed. Less content creators making pranks ultimately led to less relevancy for the genre as a whole. This then led to even fewer reviews from individuals such as H3H3, creating a downward spiral where each negative element was creating further negative elements, like the idea of the rich get richer but in reverse. And in case the landscape for pranksters wasn't already on a downward slope, Facebook was about to join YouTube by changing their algorithm, giving pranksters another nail in the coffin. When Facebook changed their algorithm, I think it was around 2017, 2016, they, they did an algorithm change that less favored articles. I'm sure many of you remember Facebook in 2015 and 2016. It was almost impossible to go through five to ten posts without bumping into a SoFlo Antonio prank video. Today we're looking at SoFlo Antonio. This guy calls himself an entrepreneur, but really he's more like the Facebook version of that weird foreign kid who creeps out all the girls in your class. I remember specifically watching like a lot of SoFlo on Facebook in around 2015 and 2016. Yep. And then by 2017, it was just, it was gone, man. By 2017, Facebook had implemented numerous algorithm changes such as posts with clickbait headlines will rank lower in the newsfeed, posts that link to websites with low quality experience will rank lower in the newsfeed, which quite heavily affected pranksters like Joey Salads. Companies would take prank videos because they're very clickbait and they'll put it on their website, put it on their Facebook, and it will go viral, 100,000 plus likes and they'll make a ton of money from the website links, clicks, and I'll get a ton of views because it's embedded. And they did this with a lot of pranksters. Once Facebook kind of took that away, that kind of went down with it. 
a lot of the external viewership and the external clicks completely got er eradicated because of yeah, the Facebook right. change. And this whole point about Facebook and the algorithm no longer favoring certain pieces of content also kind of plays into the next and final point. The fact that pranks just don't really compare to the comparable clickbait in recent times. The Trump administration, Buzzfeed, heavy political outrage. People these days have so much more to be angry about in comparison to some YouTuber faking a prank. However, in a backwards kind of way, a lot of these changes benefited the creator is making genuine content. And I'd be doing a disservice to the minority of pranksters who are still thriving on the platform if I talk exclusively about the negative. You've got people like Big Doors TV still gaining hundreds of thousands of views per video with real pranks. That was epic, gaining north of 1 million views almost every video. And Cassidy Campbell, who's maintained a relatively loyal audience with his bizarre style. And I like to think that these individuals prove a point. Pranking never really died. It just evolved from who could execute the most dangerous thing to who could execute the kindest, smartest, or fearless good thing for other people. However, in the process, the overdone fake pranking subgenre lost a lot of steam, owed massively to the fall of fake prank reviews, which caused the culture surrounding pranks to dissipate, giving it the perception of a dead genre. This, in conjunction with the adpocalypse, changes in the Facebook algorithm as well as the incomparable interest in pranks, has caused many pranksters to either quit or slow down their upload schedule to a point at which they're unable to maintain relevancy. And in 2019, even the infamous prank invasion left YouTube and disappeared off the internet, perhaps displaying the fall of the genre up until today. We'll finish with Joey Salad's personal explanation as to why he thinks pranks fell out of the spotlight. Thank you guys for watching. Like and subscribe. I'll see you in the next one. In summary, what caused the big fall of the pranking genre on YouTube as a genre is the bubble popped of fakeness and there was just... it. it it got too big and it just popped. It wasn't an interest anymore for, the, I guess, those the community to talk about, like H3H3 H3 and review channels wasn't of interest anymore because that bubble popped. Uh, algorithm changes, uh, the demonetization, um, and also external algorithm changes. I guess that is all what played a big factor.